Well, that's interesting. Facebook really cuts off the window in a strange way. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Audio is not bad. Okay, so that really is what the window is going to look like. So if I'm sitting here, my guest is sitting here, and we have a head right here. No theme music today, maybe? No theme music today, maybe? Hey, we have a viewer. Hey Mike, how's it going? Mike, are you still, aren't you away volunteering on some activist hey, endeavor? Hey Mike, how's it going? Mike, are you still? Let's see, what else could we do here? Go live using YouTube from my computer. Hello, Carmen. We're going to start the interview as soon as my uh, guest arrives. This is my first uh, Facebook Live video. I've, uh, this, is the, this will be the fourth episode of my podcast, which is called The Mindful Activist. So there's a Facebook page for that. You can go see the first three interviews. They're quite exciting. Back in town for a couple days, interning with Pramila Jayapal's campaign. I don't know how to say that. Interning with it. I assume that's an amazing, progressive, Bernie Sanders-like candidate. Yaron Samid, I cannot believe you just joined my Facebook Live. How's it going, Yaron? This Facebook thing is crazy. <laughs> This is Yaron Samid. This is one of my oldest friends uh, from seventh grade. Yeah, that's what I figured, Mike. Amazing progressive candidate. Yaron, you still playing volleyball? I'm probably playing volleyball tonight on the beach. My body can barely handle it. You know, I'm going to go ahead and start, I'm going to start what's called a Zoom video chat, and uh, technically any of you that want to could actually join in. <laughs> Thank you. Yaron, you have like a family now, don't you? We haven't talked in years, you and me, like 10, 10 years or something. Alex, still sketching. I've got some art. I've got a moment. I'll show you some art. Until my guest arrives. This is my, this is my masterpiece. 
that, but it's still, it's like, how old is this? It might be 10 years old, this guy. Really like this one. And then this is back from college. These are all very philosophical. Then we've got this guy, also very philosophical. Anyone want to guess what these uh, threads represent? And then back here in the works, this guy is going to be finished someday. Got like 40 hours in this guy so far. This is like, this is a work of art right there in itself. You know how long it took to do this crazy hand? Now this is a, well, this is pencil sketched and this is a acrylic paint. I just can't get over this hand. I mean, look at that hand. That is like the most in crazy thing I've ever done in my life, painting that Terminator hand on that. I should really go outside and make sure Barbara knows how to find a way into my house. So, what's the mechanic called? Well, let's see. Title wise, it's a meditating uh, robot. It's sort of symbolic of. Um, how I believe uh, technology will eventually help um, us become a more enlightened society. And so it's sort of the war, the robot that was built to be a war machine, meditating, sort of showing, you know, our technology itself might become enlightened. Now, never, so well, I haven't really sold anything since college, so I just sit on All right, so I'm going to start recording there. Okay, so Barbara's not here yet, so I'm gonna step outside. Hey, Rebecca. Um, so I'm gonna start shortly. I gotta go see if, uh, if my guest is outside. I'm gonna leave the video going, because I do that. You're on, I would totally love to meet up and hang out sometime. Come to the Seattle area. Um, don't you live, where do you live? Like New York or something? Okay, but I gotta check outside to see if um, Barbara's here. So everyone just sort of enjoy this. Uh, you know what I should do? I should play a video. You can watch this video while I go. Nah, we won't do that. All right, I'll be back in a sec. All right, that just seems crazy to leave all you guys just sitting here. So why don't I just take you outside and we'll wait for Barbara together. And then we can keep. Has, have any of you actually watched any previous episodes of the podcast, The Mindful Activist? Any of you actually? Uh, anyone know that I had a podcast going? Hey, did I stay live during that phone call? <laughs> I, I had a phone call so it might have froze up so let's see yeah you're Ron where do you live yes I was asking you a question yeah maybe it freezes during the phone call <laughs> you were enjoying the couch nice my guest has arrived um, Alana, this is so, this is the most audience I've ever had because I've been doing most of my broadcasts on, <laughs> and, and we're actually live right now on Facebook. Oh. So, uh, just so you know, okay. you know, beware of what you say. 
Not that you ever be aware of what you no, say. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for. Yeah, thanks for having me over. All right, so we are going to set up in the living room here. Okay. And uh, I was thinking you could sit here on the end of the couch and I'll set this up. Great. Everyone frozen? Anyone, anyone able to see video? You might have to like close Facebook and come back in or something. Rebecca, you're on my list of people to interview for this uh, show, this podcast. All right, so Facebook is kind of funky with its the the video screen. Mm -hmm. It gives us um, this like narrow right. vertical window, but we have this video going. So let's see. We're we're gonna sit sort of close to each other here while I interview you. <laughs> okay, no problem. That's not bad. And let's see. This though gets a nice shot. And all right, we're gonna go ahead now. Before we we haven't officially started. Okay. Um, but what I've done is I have what's called a. Um, I have the option of starting a video conference mm -hmm. that would allow other people to join our conversation. Oh. They could just drop in mm -hmm. um, and join in. Um, it might disrupt if we're in the middle of an interview, but it also would be kind of interesting. Sure. Um, so are you okay with sure, us doing no that? Problem. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start that. Sylvia, I believe, Sylvia, aren't you a high school friend? That's, those are all the people. We have eight people actually watching us sit oh, here on the couch. hi. This is Barbara Mori. I'll give her an official introduction once we start the official podcast. And we're live on Facebook. We don't need to share that. Okay, so there we are, and... We will record, stop this video on Facebook. We're not even very late, are we? We're almost on time. Not that I scheduled anything. It was exactly 10 when I pulled up this morning, so. Yeah. Okay, so we're also on this one. If anyone drops in, they'll appear on that screen. Okay. Yaron <laughs> says, hi, Barbara. Okay. Hi. Um, so, welcome to the fourth episode of the Mindful Activist Podcast. Uh, I'm the host, Matt Reddy. I am, um, I am an activist. I'm a meditation um, practitioner, practitioner of mindfulness. Um, I'm also an uh, the developer of the Hive1.net software um, and the founder of the Global Consensus Project, and I'm an elected politician. I'm a hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington State. Um, I'm joined today with Barbara Mori, um, who I know as a amazing activist. Um, but that's and that's mainly how we've interacted, and that's um, uh, that's really. I know a lot about your activist activities. I don't actually, uh, I also know you're a mother. Um, yeah. I have 42 foster children and one biological child. You have 42 foster children. Yes, all teenagers. Um, and I have them four at a time, usually. Um, all girls, except for two little brothers that happen to tag along over wow. a period of 10 years. That's, uh, that's amazing. That's right. I, I've heard... I've heard you mention that over over the years that we've known each other. So that's so you are quite the nurturing uh, soul in this world. Well, it turned out that way. I didn't intend to have any children. Yeah. And then my husband died, and I realized that everything the value from him was put in a shoebox, 
And I called my mother shortly after his death and I said, I'm going to have a baby. And she said, you're what? <laughs> and I said, yes, I want somebody to warp in my own image. Wow. So I have a daughter, Rebecca, um, who is very independent and very much her own image. Um, I always thought that if I kind of brought her up right, she'd think independently, but that would always end up to think like me. Um, that was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> So she, she, she thinks independently, but not always like you. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same kind of, um, I think the same thing happened to my dad. You know, he uh, he raised me to be a really critical thinker and mm -hmm. to, um, to question things and to analyze things. And I think he got a little uh, frustrated when I got into college and my values and beliefs started to diverge yes. from his. Yep. And I don't think he's ever gotten over that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think my parents ever did really either. Yeah. So, interesting. Okay. Is there anything else background-wise you'd like the, the vast audience of viewers to know about you before we get into <laughs> well, I spent Well, I spent my professional career in the field of education. And I was an educational administrator. Um, and I chose, I was a child of the 60s. I, my high school class was 1966. So we had Vietnam, we had civil rights, we had all kinds of things going on. You graduated in 66. High school, graduated in 66, right. And so were you, as a high schooler, was, uh, I don't know, when were the, was there major protests going on up while you were in high school? Not where I was. Um, I lived in a, a rural northern Wisconsin community, and we had Native Americans, and that was kind of the, the underclass of our community, but we didn't have a lot of the other um, the things that were going on in a lot of civil rights issues, but my family was involved with civil rights issues. Um, my father was a minister, and through the conference of the church, he was involved in um, not demonstrations and all so much, but in writing letters of support and um, drumming up support for people to listen to issues and participate in talking about issues. Hmm. Okay, so so at either in high school or after high school, were you involved with? Uh, Vietnam protests? Oh yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, I started, my first activism was actually when I was around 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. um, my father was um, protesting at a local grocery store in a little tiny town um, and he was demonstrating because there was some issue about about the, the grocery stores had all decided to be open on a certain night so that the farmers could come in and this one grocery store thought well they get the business by staying open another night. So my father went down there with a picket sign saying um, give Fridays a chance and I went down with him and that was my first demonstration and he was down there all by himself walking with his picket back and forth and for years after that in the local parade kind of like the roadie festival our local parade there um, there were people saying we want Friday night or we want Saturday night and it was it was kind of became a, a community joke almost but it was my first experience with being on a picket line nice mm -hmm. interesting so well, before we get into more stories, um, I should ask you the one question I ask my guests. I only have one set question, which okay. is, do you consider yourself an activist? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how long has that been like a part of your idea? Has it, has it been since you were 12 or is it, yes. that was your first experience? Uh, it's been, it's come in different ways um, over the years, but it's been since I was 12 or maybe even younger. Um, but yes, it's been a long time. I remember as a child, um, we were traveling, we took family vacations, and we were traveling, and we came to a gas station, and there were um, out of bathrooms, and I remember seeing the signs saying colored men and women. And I remember when I was a young adult, very young adult, um, going to a tavern, and they say, we don't serve Indians and dogs. Okay, so this was, it's been part of my life, of, of being active in something, and being aware of situations. It's been part of my life, all my life. So, um... I'm very curious how people react when they're faced with conflict, when they're faced with power, and um, activists, have uh, they encounter that, depending on what type of activism they do it in various ways, but mm -hmm. do you, um, in general, how do you react to a power conflict when, you, when it is, is up against you? Um, first of all, the old thing of speak truth to power, I think is very real. And are you able to do that? Most of the time. Yeah. Um, but also using humor and using um, the power of people. The, the, 
for example, uh, my house went into foreclosure a few years ago, and I was writing for an underground press at the time. And I went through the whole thing. I fought the foreclosure, it went through the sale, and then I called up the bank afterwards and I said, you know, um, I'm planning to write an article and I'd like to just give you the information about it. And I had actually worked out to have 25 raging grannies and grandpas tied to rocking chairs in my house to be evicted when I got my eviction. And Did that actually happen? That they they would they canceled that they rescinded the sale as if it had never happened, and then they, we went on and got a modification of the mortgage and everything, and I'm still in my home. Okay, so your tactic: they were going to evict you, mm -hmm. and you got an eviction notice. Yes, and you had a date yes. of the eviction, and yes. so what you did, you organized a ton of elders, mm -hmm. who you called the the raging grannies. Yes. To, to be ready to sit in your house. Tied to rocking chairs. Tied to rocking chairs so that when they came to evict, you'd have these, <laughs> they'd have to decide to untie these elders from. And haul them out in their rocking chairs or some way. And we had already made plans to contact the press. I had sent out a news release. Uh, I had a news release ready um, for the press and I had talked to a few people that I know in the, in the press to be able to say, this may be coming up. And I said, keep us informed. Did you have cameras ready for the incident? You bet, yeah. cameras, reporters, the whole thing. See, now we would use, we would have this. We'd yes. have Facebook Live right. and YouTube. We would be ready to live stream mm -hmm. the whole event. Right. Um, it's such an amazing power, the power of recording. Yes. Of transparency and recording. Um, I mean, I've encountered this in many parts of my life. Um, you know, on the commission it's come up, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if you just, if you just say to people that are using their power in a, you know, and you think they're using their power in a way that's wrong, mm -hmm. you just say, I'm just going to record it. I'm right. going to show how you use your power, um, in the world and we'll see how it turns out for both of us. We'll see, you know, how the world reacts because it forces the rest of the world to judge right. what happened. Right. I mean, it's. It's kind of what happened, um, I mean, a much more extreme example, but, but with the, uh, uh, in the civil rights movements with those, uh, the groups that went down to the South and went yes. into uh, restaurants and just said they just wanted to be served mm -hmm. and then violence occurred and, you know, the world was sort of forced to see this is what is happening and we have to now judge what is happening and, and it puts pressure on the world to decide where they are. Right. Morally, is what's going on. And I think that at that time, I remember hearing Walter Cronkite saying something about television changed the civil rights movement, and television gave validity to the civil rights movement. And and I think that the people's press, the the individual recordings like people are doing now, is the same kind of thing. It's a very powerful instrument for addressing all kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, my attitude is. Um, I mean, this has come up on Facebook Live, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, people videotaping uh, a police action or police shooting, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you were aware of this, but that one where the um, uh, the man was shot in the car and the woman started Facebook Live videoing yes. it, mm -hmm. I don't remember the names, right. um, but I believe it was up on Facebook Live and Facebook took it down um, for at least for a while, and this is like... Uh, and I mean, it was, and it did go back up, but it was like such an important moment in our media and social media history because um, if these cameras have the power to, uh, to capture injustice, then it puts the social media company in the place of censorship or not censored. Do they show yeah. a horrible thing that's happening or do they censor it? Um, or when, when police cams get um, instantly turned off for some reason. Um, that's another indication of you know, the power of, of having the videos and the recordings and things. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ron just threw us a, a pretty awesome question. Okay. How can the internet be better leveraged to harness and scale local and global people power for effective activism? Um, what needs to be built? Well, yeah. Do you have an answer for that? I have an answer for that. You, you give your answer because I'm not, I'm not big, a big part of the technological world. I have, I have internet and I do Facebook and I do you know, something and I have a video camera. Yeah. But I'm still connected to my video camera or to my actual camera as opposed to the camera in my phone and so on. So take it away. Yeah. 
Uh, well, funny you should ask that, uh, Yaron, uh, <laughs> because uh, um, the the software I built, the Hive One .NET software, and the Global Consensus Project is all about basically that figuring out how to use the internet to leverage people power to find alternatives to uh, corrupt hierarchical systems. So, and we'll do on for future episodes, we're going to do more sort of demos of how that works. Um, I did start this, uh, this thing, but I didn't actually share the link with anyone. So no one would know oh, that, okay. they could, that, that they could jump in. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to post the link now that any of you could use to join this conversation in video. Um, and I'm going to post that. While he's doing that, um, I was pre-technology pre in my career and everything, too. I remember when we first had data information systems and when we first had um, computerized sign-in sheets for employees and for students and everything in the school. And we kept records of everything handwritten in addition because we were not trusting this new technology. Um, and when I would get printouts of so the fold of the pages that were accordion type pages, I'd get printouts of those every month about all the students and all the activities that were going on and what my budget was and all. And that to me was high technology. But I also had a, had a job working in a community, uh, in a credit bureau, which when I first graduated from college, there were no teaching jobs available. So I worked for a credit bureau and I happened to be there at the time that the Fair Credit Reporting Act went into place and several of the fair credit issues were, were raised. And I was formally trained at a national level about consumer rights and consumer protection. I had no idea that I'd ever use that, and yet it's come in so handy at some time later in my life. So, so I was pre-technology, and I'm now approaching 70, and I, I'm pretty comfortable with the technology I have, but, um, but because I've made that transition, I recognize how important it is to have the technology but also it's important to have the, um, the, the background of understanding what's behind the technology, what the, what the sign-in sheets mean, what the, what the statistics mean, instead of just putting them on a, on a computer or something and coming up with the answer. What does it mean when I do this? What does it mean when I participate in that? So, All end right. of lecture. Nice. <laughs> Jeez, that was great. I can just step away and you'll talk. Sure. <laughs> to the audience. That is so great. My, my daughter says, put a nickel in me and I can do the whole dog and pony show. So, um, well, since you're on ass, and I, I started to explain it, um, I don't know, have I talked, have I, have you no, looked at any of this? I okay. Um, so, uh, Barbara and I were extremely involved with the Occupy, uh, Port Townsend movement. Um, that is actually how we met. And we could, we could give a little bit of that history. Um, when I, I, probably the first day I showed up um, at the Occupy, the little Occupy Port Townsend protest. Uh, that was going on every Saturday at for two to four or something. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine you were probably there. Oh, yes. Uh, you were often, <laughs> often there. Um, and do you remember what happened that day when we first met? I'm not sure. Go ahead and remind Okay, me. so we, uh, I basically, I came up to the group and I said, um, I'm a facilitator and I'm aware of how the Occupy movement has been doing group facilitation. I've sort of been studying it. I could help us do a general assembly. And uh, we, the group, you know, we facilitated a little meeting right there and we decided to meet up and plan a uh, general assembly. And I don't know if, if he's still here, if Alex is still in the audience, um, but you remember Alex, mm -hmm. uh, Brian? Hi, Alex. Uh, yeah, he was, he was there and he, um, um, he helped us sort of come up with a plan for how to facilitate a general assembly. We came up That's with agreements right. mm -hmm. for um, how we would do proposals, how we would do consensus. Mm -hmm. We probably had like three weeks of planning meetings. Yes. We brought a guy from, a facilitator from Occupy Seattle came right. over one night. I think yes. Sean was his name and he helped us plan it. And, uh, and so then we had this massive uh, general assembly, Occupy general assembly down at the UU um, mm -hmm. fellowship. And out of that General Assembly, working groups, Occupy working groups got created and they started meeting and, I don't know, over the next year, Occupy Port Townsend was doing uh, really interesting activist protests against money in politics, corporate power, um, foreclosures, mm -hmm. um, 
and you and I were like meeting all the time right. uh, during the weeks and, and these protests, you know, the, the big Bank of America protests. I, we that had, was so fun. That was amazing. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I edit this together, I'll put video, I'll, I'll show some of the video and you'll see Barbara okay. there. I think you were wearing your like Statue of Liberty, Statue of Liberty thing and you're <laughs> dancing around. Yes. And we shut down the, the drive through the Bank of America. That was really cool. <laughs> and we had the parade through town carrying the tent. All right, so there's been a couple comments. So I, I should explain the link that I put in there that you're saying is kind of uh, useful. So the link is for joining this video conference. Oh, I should plug this in too, just in case we lose power. I'm glad this is you and not me. <laughs> yeah, seeing Facebook Live doesn't support links. There's no way to copy and paste that link. That's really interesting. Um, so in any case, if anyone wants to join this talk, it, the link that I posted um, to the Zoom uh, software would actually take you into uh, the video conference. And we could actually have up to 50 people video conferencing and talking to us right now using this Zoom video conferencing link. It looks like you're on saying it doesn't, it's really hard to click the link and I'm sorry about that. This is, this is the fourth episode, so we'll get these kinks worked out. Um, and then we'll just go with it if someone does drop in. Sure. Um, but the, the sort of the reason I'm sort of like you know, attempting to thread all of this together. So what I learned from the General Assembly uh, process and the, the consensus process that we were experiencing in Occupy, that was what really taught me how to be in a group without hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And, and it was like totally... Um, it just like it was like a revelation to me. Uh, this we need to figure out how to do more of this, more non-hierarchical, non-power dynamic group decision making, and we need to figure out how to do it on a mass scale. Right. And so that's what I've been working on. That's what the Global Consensus Project is literally. How do you get global consensus? How do you how do you facilitate global consensus on issues? And the the Hive One software is. Um, my first attempt as a facilitator to design software that could let us facilitate wow. a million people wow. um, using same basically the same thing I did when I facilitated general assemblies or mm -hmm. when we did that. So um, this podcast is really just a way of telling people about that software. Sure, that's fine. But, but you know, <laughs> I mean, but I love it also, there's a benefit to talking about activism because there's a lot of people say no mm -hmm. when you ask them if they're an activist. Mm -hmm. And then I ask, well, do you care about do you care about what's going on in the world? Do you have any issues you want uh, things to change? And most people say yes. There are some things they care about. And then I ask, do you do anything to try to impact those issues? And then they, sometimes they describe all this activist activities, but they don't like the label activist. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've come to some tr transitions in that too. I've, I'm now officially an advocate as opposed to an activist in terms of mm. how I introduce myself. I'm an advocate for affordable housing. I'm an advocate for special education students. I'm an advocate for people who are homeless. Yeah. Um, and, and it's still the activism, it's just, it's a different form of activism. And it, I think with my age, um, I become less physically active and more um, active I guess in using the technology for one. I've been writing an awful lot of letters to the city council and the planning commission and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which I wouldn't have been able to do previously. You'd have to go in and speak all the time. Yeah. Um, but but I've become more of an advocate, and that's I think that's my role at this time because I have the experience of all these years, and being able to pull that together a little bit, um, I'm not able to go out and physically march as much as I'd like to. Um, or attend all the committee meetings or anything else. I'm just physically not as able to do that. But I am able to sit at my computer and <laughs> and send notes to other people and say, get involved, and Tuesday night we're doing this, and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, there's, but al I, there's always something you can do, well, you know? Mm -hmm. There's always, always options. Right. Well, when you mentioned that we were going to be talking today and you invited me, I, I started getting all kinds of ideas in my head. And what I came up with is the power of activism. Mm. And it's not necessarily how you do it, but, but that you are involved. For example, um, the power of the individual voice. My dad going to that grocery store 
and picketing all by himself. And the grocery store then started closing on the nights that everybody agreed to and stayed open on the nights that everybody agreed to. One lone voice did that. Um, or the power of music in the civil rights movement. Music was such an important part of what we were doing. And we sang our way through the events of the civil rights movement. Or the power of speaking up. Um, when, I was, when I was a young adult, I confronted an adult for the very first time of getting in his face and saying, no, you're wrong. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, I was at the home of a friend who was, they were first generation Polish. And the father said, if they'd shoot a few more of these, um, we wouldn't have any problem anymore with race. And I actually said, no, you're wrong. And I stood up for the very first How time. How old were you? I was probably 18. No, 19. And, and who was this you were saying? This was the father of a friend. Okay. And, and the father, he was first generation immigrant from Poland, okay? And he was very definitely in a different world, different mindset from what I had been. Yeah. So I stood up to him. But what happened is his son then went with me to the open housing marches that were being held that week in Milwaukee, as Wisconsin. A, was it a, as a result of your standing up to him? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, so it's, you know, the power of, of an individual speaking up and, and confronting even those that we wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable with. You know, I was always taught respect your elders, and boy, at home if I had said something, I would... You know? <laughs> right. So was, yeah, that's a I've I've encountered that in other situations. You know, it's like you think, you know, there's no point in challenging this person because mm -hmm. there is you're like it's just going to create a heated moment, and it may not like, you, and you pretty much know it is not going to change this person's mind of where they is. Right. But there is a ripple effect of you doing that, mm -hmm. you speaking up for what is what you think is right. It affects other people that hear it and right. that are that are, don't have the strength or courage in that moment to do it and they wish someone would, mm -hmm. it gives them some of that, you know, it gives them some charge of energy and courage, even though it is potentially personally painful for you to do it. And frightening. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so did that experience uh, make you feel like, oh, I could do this again? Or did it make you feel like, I never want to do this again? This is really no, painful. No, it me. actually, it was painful. But after I got thinking about it, and, and I went on to the march, and the sun went with me, it was like, oh, there's some power there. You know, it was a, we didn't use the word empowerment at that time, it was too early. But, but there was some power there. There was a sense of, I can do this, and it's not going to, I'm not going to die. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, in some situations you might. But, but it was, it was a, a moment when I realized that I could directly address things that I saw as, being unjust and have it turn out okay and actually like you said have a ripple effect and it wasn't my intention to do that at all it just was it was one time when I had to speak out because it was so blatantly incorrect un unjust unjust um, in what he was saying and so biased yeah. so. but um, some other things that I've learned um, so I happen to make a little list being an educator you know I Right, yeah, down. and uh, and Yaron's still asking good questions. There oh, is good. a site, hive1.net is the website. Um, at some point, we're going to have like somebody watching the Facebook okay. uh, comments, and then maybe uh, we'll figure out a way to in how to have our conversation and check in with the comments. Um, Do a Tom Hartman thing, huh? Tom, is that what I don't know what that Tom, is. Tom Hartman is is the progressive speaker on on. Uh, Free speech TV oh, and okay. and serious and all and he takes he has people talking in but he has earplugs in and then he has a computer in front of him and his staff or his co-workers are always sitting there and typing so and so says such and what you want and he talks on the phone to people and everything so. yeah it yeah. is I mean it's like it's a lot going on you know yes. it's like with the chat comments <laughs> and if we have someone drop in um, but this is this is why I built the software I built because mm -hmm. it's like you have to think about you have a thousand people in the room. How do you interact right. with a thousand people in a, in a sensible way? Yeah. Uh, and a protest. That's the what's the best way to engage these people pragmatically? So interesting. So in Israel, we are repeatedly on the receiving end of protests. What's the best way to engage these people pragmatically? Mm -hmm. um, so the thing of truth to power to me just 
just encapsulates that. How do we approach people? And when we approach, like in, in the situation with Israel and Palestine, okay, if we, if we make it personal, if we make it not just, not just numbers of how many people were killed and how many bombs were there and who they came from and all that kind of thing, but, but make it personal. These families, these incidents happen. And then to, to speak truth of why did these happen? What happened here? What was behind this? And address those truths, then, then we, we can impact the power. And I really think that that's true on a national and international level and on an interpersonal level. Yeah, it's, um, I've learned a lot from living in a community. You know, I live in an intentional community. Yes. And you see conflict um, at a very, you know, at a very raw personal level occur. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to see, extrapolate how this just, in a, in a, in a community anywhere, how little conflict just balloons into massive, you know, uh, conflicts of groups. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you can do it in a community of 20 people, that you can have this, this con conflict, this divide between people, and they're not talking to each other, mm -hmm. and they are, um, they're bitter about something that happened so years ago. Yeah, and then it's, um, it all comes down to, ba basically what you're saying, it's just like a lack of personal understanding, mm -hmm. lack of empathy for what's going on with the other person, and then... Because usually, I mean, I'm not claiming to be good at this, but if we had a conflict over something, I mean, the the cure is you just have to go and see what is at the root of it. Right. What is, um, what is, and I guess the way they say it, what is your root need? What need is it that you're trying to, to fulfill with this item that we're in conflict over? What need am I trying to fulfill that seems to put me in conflict with you? Because when you do that, if you break it down, you often see your needs are not actually opposed to each other. Mm -hmm. It's you think, it's like you think your the solution that you've come up with and my solution, we've come up with different solutions and those are in conflict. But if we go back to the need, right. and then we look at our co need and we say, how can we create a solution that works for both of us? It, in my experience, um, the vast majority of the time, there is a there are great co creating solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like we get one, we get attached to our position Yes. and it's like, and then it's <laughs> ego. It's like, and I see this on the, the commission on mm -hmm. the hospital board and you know, it's like person has been fighting for this position. Now they're attached to that. You come in and you say, well, that's not the greatest idea. Um, you try to say it gently. You try to say, I know you've been attached to this idea for a long time, but what if we did it this way? Mm -hmm. That there might be some benefits to that. It's very hard to let go right. of the idea you were defending. It also, you can feel like a pride thing, you know, of like, it makes you look like you were wrong. And so then, you know, you have this feeling of people think I was wrong about something. And there's, especially if you're a politician, mm -hmm. you know, to be, to change your mind um, publicly can kind of make you, um, make some people feel uh, weak in the eyes of, so I think I think what you were saying about getting to the root of the problem and not not just working on the solution is very important, because it's a matter of, for example, in dealing with homelessness in Jefferson County now, um, we all know now that it's a big problem in Jefferson County. We have 355 homeless individuals that are we have the third highest number of veterans that are homeless in the state behind King County and Thurston County. So we are. We have a huge number. Third highest number. In the state. Number of vets. Like not raw right. number. Raw number in of a, vets. In a county of 30,000 people, Correct. we have... The third, third highest number of veterans mm -hmm. homeless how in many, the state. How many people? That, that I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know the number. Right. Um, and we're behind King County and Thurston County, which of course are big urban yeah. urban areas. Yeah. Um, we have, we have um, Section 8 vouchers, which is a problem all over with the subsidized housing and all this. We have 137 vouchers and there's... Um, an estimated 44 places for them to use their vouchers. So, so, so we know the problem, but then how do we solve that? Well, some of us have gone out and started a tent village. Well, tent village has all kinds of connotations to it. So there are politicians and people in offices who say, we can't have tent villages, this is bad, that looks bad, and all this kind of thing. Then we go to them and say, what can we do instead of that? 
Okay, well then we'll have it at this location. That's good. We'll go to a particular campground and rent spaces there so it's not so um, in your face. Okay, and then from there it's a matter of, but what do we do long term? Well, we need a 24-7 shelter. Okay, so who's going to do that and how are we going to do that? And instead of being this way, which we started off being, um, we are now at least talking the same talk and beginning to understand how the how we can begin to address some of these issues and that we must address them, that it's not an option whether or not we're going to address them. We must address these issues. And so, so um, like the county commission meets tonight, or the city council meets tonight to talk about the comp plan and they're talking specifically about housing and affordable housing and the homeless situation because we brought it up as an issue over the last two years. This is city council city, tonight. City council Four tonight. Four towns and city council meeting tonight. 6.30 tonight. Mm -hmm. 6.30, and they're going to be talking about... The homeless um, encampments, tent encampments, mm -hmm. and housing for the homeless um, as it applies to the comprehensive plan. So okay. and what they're planning to do for the next 10 years, of concrete plans, goals, policies, and all that kind of thing. And what do you think they should do? I think, first of all, we need to have more affordable housing. We just plain don't have enough facilities, enough units. And that's going to take five to ten years minimum to develop. I think we need to have some strong interim measures. Things like a 24-7 shelter. Um, there's the, for example, um, there's the un old Union Bank building that's closed up on Sims Way. That would make an excellent place, excellent location, advertisement here, <laughs> an excellent location for a 24-7 shelter. It's near DSHS, it's near um, social services for mental health, it's near things for uh, drug addiction programs, it's off of the downtown route, it's on a bus stop, it's near the grocery stores. Anyway, so so kind of putting a plug in to do something like that, have a 24-7 shelter. We could also have a village of tiny houses, which is happening all across the country in dealing with homelessness. And um, I have a location in mind that I'm really attached to. I had to smile when you mentioned that because I'm truly attached to a particular location, <laughs> which the county has said no way, yeah. um, but I'm still attached to it. And so, but if they could come up with another way that we could do this, that what, would what work. What location? Do you want to tell what location? Sure. Uh, there used to be a county community, uh, county campground right next to the Tri Area Center in Chimicum. It was a park that has twelve. It's a park of twelve acres. It had thirty designated campsites originally. It mm -hmm. has a shelter building that's in disrepair, but it has water and electricity to the shelter building. Um, it's been closed since two thousand nine, and officially the repurposing of it is for a potential dog park. So, after researching that out and checking out the plans and everything, um, we proposed it to the county for a place to put a village of 10 to 15 tiny houses. Tiny houses are 250 square feet or less. They are essentially similar in function and, and size to an RV. Mm -hmm. So it would be natural to put them in a campground, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the county has responded with this. We have plans, governmental use plans for these for this property, and you may not use it. Um, but there's nothing in the official plans, in the planning commission plans, in the anything there on paper um, that says what their plans are. So in the interim, while they're doing that, we could have our village of tiny houses there for three, four, five years, while everybody else is getting the more permanent housing going. So, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on that, and um, I would gladly take another location. But what they're doing across the country for housing uh, with these tiny villages like Quixote Village in Olympia and in, in Eugene, Washington, and Eugene, Oregon, and in Portland, and so on, the government municipalities are leasing land, public land, to a nonprofit to set up a village of tiny houses. So if the county or the city has some unused public property that they would like to lease to a nonprofit for five years, ten years, something like that, for us to have a village of tiny houses as interim housing, mm -hmm. I'm all for it. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the the housing issue? I was going to go back to. Um... No, I think that's I think okay. that's enough right now. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So just uh, I'd love to ask a couple more questions about how you work with power. Okay. Um, so have there. Um, have there been instances where you had where the, the power conflict came to um, pretty intense moments? Um, you said, I mean, you were prepared for the eviction. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, but that moment didn't actually happen. Right. And so I have there been moments where um, you've had a, a pretty intimidating level of force in front of you. Um, <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. I was at a demonstration at Dow Chemical during the Vietnam War. They were the makers of napalm. And I was at the plant and I had arrived early for the demonstration and I ended up right in front of the gates, the main gates. And the crowd started coming in and they were, there were some disturbances in the crowd. Um, police were arresting people and pushing people around and all. And I was pushed right toward the gate. And on the other side of the gate, there were security people with bayonets, <clears throat> bayonets attached to their guns. Sticking them through the fence. Bayonets. Bayonets. The knife thingy that goes on the end of a gun. Sticking them through the fence, pointing at us demonstrators. You and we were police being police or security? Security inside the Dow Chemical plant. Security with bayonets. Yes. <laughs> it's just it's like mm. I, I just can't uh, yeah. get over that, okay? Yep. And so they were they were inside the gate on the Dow Chemical side with their bayonets pointed outside the fence, and we were being pushed towards them by the crowd. Um, that was very scary. That was very, very scary. So, mm -hmm. but we survived and um, we were able to, I'm not sure how we even got out of that, but I remember going to the side somehow and, yeah. and that, that we didn't make it, we didn't get skewered. So how do you react in moments like that? Um, if someone's raising their voice to you, um, how do you like, do you um, rise up to it? Do you freeze? Do you, um, or do you walk? Do you go away and have to regroup? What what type of? It it kind of depends on the situation. Generally, what I do is I do this. Um, it's not a freeze, but I call it icy cold response, mm -hmm. and it allows me to to um, be a more objective or not necessarily objective. I don't think that's right the right word, but to be more um, controlled in what I'm doing in my response. And so I, it's like taking a deep breath. And then recentering, okay, mm -hmm. is what we'd say in current languages. <laughs> Yaron says he needs to drop, but he said thank you for. Oh, <laughs> all right, bye. <laughs> See, it's so it's like I don't know whether we should like respond to the the chat no, while you're in fine. the middle of saying. No, that's something. fine. Okay. Um. So so <laughs> I I try to get I try to get in control and centered, and then continue with the confrontation. I don't think that I don't like to back down. I don't think that it serves a positive purpose in most situations. There are times when it's important to back down, but um, those are times when it's a life-threatening kind of thing, and then you don't back down, you step back. And I think there's a difference between the two. But I, for me personally, it's a matter of getting centered and then continuing, and I use my voice a lot. Um, and I've been told that I, my voice gets very strident when I get mm. in these kind of positions, and I imagine it does. Um, and sometimes that's not to my benefit or the benefit of the cause that I'm representing because my voice then becomes a weapon in effect. Yeah. And that's not, that's not positive either. So I need to learn how to control that. But, but I, don't, I don't generally tend to back down. Yeah. And then the other thing that I do is then I, when I get a chance away from the situation and reflect on it, I do address, I do come back and address the situation with the person that's involved. Um, now, in this day and age, it's by email. So if somebody says or does something that's absolutely um, out of line with reality, shall we say, okay, um, makes a statement or puts an example out there of something that's just not true, and call them on it at the point, but then go back and then off the record get hold of that person and mm -hmm. say, here's what you need to know. And I'm concerned that you are publicly stating these things and you're you're wrong and you're prejudicing people against what's the reality here and here's the truth and you need to be aware of it and then if they don't respond to that going a step further and going to their boss going to if somebody's on a board of an agency going to the agency and saying your board member is putting you your agency in jeopardy would you please talk to him about this issue um, so I, I don't just step back and go away or cower, um, but I don't always I don't always confront it directly if it's not going to serve a positive purpose and it's not going to have um, an impact a positive impact. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I I think I've learned a lot from being on the commission and you know being 
because uh, it's like I'm in frequent sort of like uh, conflict over issues, over worldviews, over values, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, you know, I sort of been feeling my way through how to deal with these conflicts. Uh, but I guess I've kind of settled on the only thing that matters is that you speak your truth and that you are, you know, and of course being, you know, continuously trying to listen and learn and see if you need to alter your view, alter, um, your ideas. But ultimately, if you're pretty clear on what your truth is in the moment of this issue, speak your truth. Um, and it doesn't matter if you win an argument or win a moment. Right. I mean, even those in those, you know, protest moments, it's like if you're there, you're standing for what you believe in, you have a sign potentially that says what you believe in, you're standing by that. Um, it's like that you've already accomplished what you need to accomplish by bringing your truth to that space. Um, and I don't know that there is... For me, there's not, um, there's, depending, it, it depends on the moment, but um, pushing when the violence happened, when the, the, the conflict, pushing on that moment, um, well, I guess I, I guess I just, I go towards the side of put yourself in the space and then make the violence press against you. Mm -hmm. Do not, you know, and so it's sort of the, just speak your truth, sit, stand for your truth, um, and if violence presses against you, then you have a decision of how much of that you're going to, are you, are you going to, uh, depends on what level of like, um, violence you're willing to, uh, experience in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you've just said is really important. Um, I think activists need to, that's exactly what we need to do as advocates. We need to speak our truth. We need to see the situation. We need to speak our truth as we see it. We need to stand for our truth. And then we need to, um, I'm, I'm very much anti-violence, okay? So we don't need to necessarily back down, but we need to address our truth in some way that's going to be nonviolent. And I think, I think what you're doing and what your, your perspective is, is, is very, very valid on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it often, on the, you know, in terms of just verbal, you know, sparring, on the commission, it's often, I say what I have to say, I get sort of like some, uh, heated argument back mm -hmm. and it's like it's almost like um, people expect oh we're gonna have a debate here and argue and see who can win the debate and I don't really um, you know I'll make a few points but you tend in these public especially in public settings people don't actually tend to be really listening I think to what other people are saying so I think growth and adaptation in these public mm -hmm. settings doesn't really happen I think good having good um, research and good knowledge of your topic helps too sure. um, sometimes it's a matter of having data and you know in this day and age we're data driven with everything but but having actual statistics and data and information facts 355 homeless individuals you know um, or or information that is that is concrete and not not something that's a debate or a matter of opinion or anything, but is a concrete piece of information. And here's the reality. Now, what do we do about it? And I think that helps a lot. And that can be done either face to face. It can be done behind scenes so that you're not so people can save face when you're having a discussion and nobody wins or loses. But to actually have, I think it's so important to have truth. Um, but truth not being just principle, standing on principle, but standing on fact as well. Yeah. Great. Um, well, is there any other topic you want to delve into that you want to share your opinion with uh, the world? Um, yes, there is one more thing. Um, back when I was living in Seattle, right. Drew, and, Drew and Deborah have uh, joined at least briefly. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to talk about the power of the grassroots, because this is really important. We okay. learned a lot of that in the Occupy movement, but also I lived in Seattle for a period of time when I was doing my foster caring and foster parenting. And at one point we had a grassroots overturning of the Seattle Public School Board. Hmm. We, we as a community got together, there was some big issues with the Seattle Public Schools, still are, but there were some big issues. And we, we got four people who were community members 
um, the community, whole community got behind him, and we overturned the Seattle Public School Board in one election. Um, and it was, it was a remarkable experience. And it was one of these things where we were all amateurs, okay? We weren't in there for the money, we weren't in there for the pride and all this, we were in there for the cause. And we won. But what I took away from that, we spent, at that time for Seattle Public School Board, it was $20,000 approximately, it cost $20,000 to run a campaign per candidate. We raised all of that within the community, kind of like it was before GoFundMe, but it was that idea. We all chipped in our pennies and nickels and dimes and made signs and all of that kind of thing. Um, but what happened after that is corporate interests came in and the next election round, where we had to have the four people in, they were in for four years, okay? The next election round, outside funding sources from major corporations, um, spent $120,000 per candidate, it turned our people out and bought the next election, okay? So, but the fact that we were able to do this, we were able to do it as a community, you know, turning over the Seattle School Board is not a minor, minor accomplishment. And during those four years, we got a lot done. But they came out, our, our people came out against charter schools and came out um, in favor of certain uh, progressive ideas for education. And the powers that be um, didn't like that. The moneyed powers that be didn't like that. And so, um, so they were thrown out of office. But the power of people being able to do that, um, you know, it was just, it was amazing to us that in this big city with these, you know, a few million people and stuff, we were able to actually turn over the school board and we were all just regular folk, you know. So, nice. so yeah, so that was really, really nice. And, and so that, that power of the people, and yes, they did get turned out again at four years later, but, but we were able to do it. And if we could do it there, we can do it other times. It's a matter of having the public will, having the public support, getting people understanding what the issues are and getting them to say, either hell no, we won't go, as in Vietnam, or, or this is what we want and this is what we don't want in standing up for it. And it can be done. And you know, that's just so, whenever I get discouraged, I go back to that and I pull out the old newspaper clippings and I look at them and I go, yeah, we can do this. We the people can do this. And it doesn't take us all of the wealth and everything, we can do this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay, I did think of another topic. I, All right. Um, so, okay, a question for you. Mm -hmm. You know how they break up populations into demographic groups, you know? Yeah. Um, do you think in terms of, uh, you know, being active for change in the world, if you were going to have, you know, 100 people of a certain demographic group, show up to a protest, and I'm not talking about race, I'm just talking mm -hmm. about like age and gender. Okay. Is there, do you think uh, a certain demographic has more power than another in terms of like, it would, 100 people of this yeah. group showed up and they were facing, you know, um, uh, big resistance from security or police. Mm -hmm. Do you see the demographic groups having different powers? Yes. I think that the, the power, the group that has the most power right now in our society is white men around the age of 40 uh, professionally employed. So I totally agree with you in terms of like, um, so you mean like in terms of a protest? I'm or just in, terms in terms of, of power? anything, in terms of power. So that's So if a hundred people, a hundred white men who are doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh -huh. whatever, show up for something, they're going to have tens, of maybe thousands, hundreds of times the power of any other demographic that shows up. And you're saying, um, that's so interesting because I'm going a completely different direction than what you're saying. It's interesting, because like during the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. I did not feel, uh, you know, professionally employed white men were the most powerful presence in those groups. No. Did, did, did you agree with me there? Well, we were a pretty, we were a pretty homogenous group here. So I don't know. See, it's well. Even here, I mean, we had we had some youth. We had some twenty somethings. We had we had elder men and women. We had you know. But we the were mix all of, white. We were all basically. Um, we all were white. all basically middle class. There were you know there weren't many of us that were not 
Yeah. You know. It's so interesting. So I've been thinking about this a lot, like especially when it comes to, like, when, um, say, the police want to drag someone away from a protest. Say, mm -hmm. you know, say the Bank of America. We were sitting in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of when violence is going to be used, even just the level of force, what I think about is who is it hardest for a police officer to do violence or a, anyone to do violence against. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think, uh, you know, white men are the hardest to do violence against. They're actually very easy to do violence against because, um, I mean, if, uh, and I didn't mean to make it a racial thing, yeah. just in terms of like um, a male force, it's, you know, if you see violence uh, between a police officer and an adult male, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if you see it against a, a high schooler or teenager, it's very different. Mm -hmm. If you see it against an elder, it's very different. If you, if mm -hmm. you see it against a elder woman, I think it's actually extremely different. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean she has power. And you were asking about power. Yeah. Okay, that's a response to violence, public violence. But but if you have if you have a demonstration going on like like a number of demonstrations we've had in Seattle, okay, WTO for example. Yeah. The people that were getting arrested were the people who were of color, the young adults who were throwing bricks, the, um, they weren't arresting women, you're right, but they weren't arresting the people who were the leaders of the, the pack, so to speak. They weren't arresting the white men who were, who were speaking at the ceremony, at the, at the demonstrations and stuff. They weren't arresting, for the most part. And they weren't arresting them violently, like oh. they were the, the protesters and all. Mm. And and I think that if you have if you have an issue that's coming up, let's even even locally at the city council, okay? City council has a meeting about anything. If you have a group of fifteen white men around forty years old go in and talk to the city council, and you have a group of fifteen white women go in and talk to the council, and you have a group of fifteen teenagers go in and talk to the council. The one the council is going to listen to the most are those white men. I hear you. I guess what I, I am really talking about um, when it comes to standing up to force, because mm -hmm. um, I think you're right. When it comes to like you know trying to make, make decisions by um, by convincing people and influence, um, there is yeah I totally totally hear what you're saying. I mean mm -hmm. there's an entrenched power. I guess it's just sort of it's something sort of that you taught me. Um, by your presence in the Occupy movement, by you coming to the uh, the Bank of America protest and you standing in the drive-thru and dancing around, mm -hmm. I realized I felt um, an enormous difference in my level of safety because you were there. Mm -hmm. Because um, having, I mean, I think of it, I've heard it referred to as like grandmother power. Mm -hmm. There is, um, and, and other activists have talked about this, um, if you have a protest and it's lots of, you know, uh, lots of young men and women doing it is one thing, but if you have grandmothers there, you know, it totally changes the feeling and it just changes the power. I feel like, yes. I mean, like, this is the way I think of it. If a, um, let's say violence broke out, not necessarily mm -hmm. cops, just like mm -hmm. violence broke out in a group and um, everyone's now screaming what to do, who are you going to listen to? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, there'll be like men screaming you know, to do something, but, um, I mean, I personally, I would like to defer to, I mean, if, if a grandmother asks you to do this, a fight for something, mm -hmm. that is like such a power. Who's going to defy that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It does. <laughs> so, I, I have an example of yeah. that. Okay. So I, w I was at a demonstration in Seattle. I don't remember what it was for this time. And we were blocking the traffic. And so the police started stopping us as we were walking down Fourth Avenue or wherever we are, we were. Um, the police would stop us before the light would go, before the light would change. And we had to be on the sidewalk. We couldn't be on the street. So there was this other older woman and I, and I happened to have my walker because I had just had my knees replaced. I had my walker and there was another woman with a cane. And the two of us looked at each other but never said a word. And we managed to step off the curb just before the police stopped the crowd from going. And it took us that whole in, that whole time of the light changed to get across that little intersection. And isn't that amazing? I mean, we could have done it in two and a half seconds, 
but it took us that whole night. And we, <laughs> we managed to do that for three different intersections <laughs> before the police caught on. So yes, there is some power there. There's a respect for it, a respect from the power groups for for older people and older women. Yeah. Um, and especially when you have a walker and a cane, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so there is some power in that, yes. Yeah, and mean, well, the raging grannies—they yeah. stopped eleven trains outside of Portland by putting wheel, sitting in wheelchairs on the tracks. Eleven trains, you know. In Whew. in many ways, in a society that's not, that actually is not willing to become a brutal, violent place, in a way, I feel like um, uh, grandmother energy is is amongst the most powerful. I think there's a youth energy too. Like if the, mm -hmm. if high schoolers came out. And I mean, there is a youth power that's mm -hmm. also incredible. It's sort of like I actually I actually sort of feel it's like at those two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And those groups often don't really realize it. Mm -hmm. They are the most powerful groups in society, if in in some ways, in in some you know dimensions of, mm -hmm. of where conflict arises, and have incredible potential for leadership, um, for the change that needs to happen. Right, and and I, the enthusiasm and the the just openness of youth is so important and it is very powerful um, it, and harnessing it isn't what you want to do because you don't want to you don't want to draw that into what we the older folks do but getting the, the youth to be able to teaching them how to use that power is very important yeah. I would I would agree with you yeah. on that yeah very yeah. absolutely and then getting involved and then having a lifetime of involvement whether you call it activism or advocacy or just being a pain in the butt um, being involved in issues that are important to them individually and then to society yeah, yeah. so, so um, I think we'll, we'll probably wrap it up there okay thank you so much for being my fourth official guest on my podcast um, I f personally find you inspiring. You know, I, I learned a lot from you uh, th through my, you know, when I became an activist. Well, that was um, mutual, Ben. We, yeah. we really did. You, you've been within the system a lot, a little bit more than I have in some ways. Hmm. And, um, and I've learned a lot from your um, studied presence. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and I hope you'll be happy to come back sometime if we have, uh, you know, a discussion that uh, you're interested in, or if you just want to be a uh, sure. Guest and will you come to jail if I end up there? If you come to jail, will you come to jail if I end up there? Yeah. All right. A, a jailhouse <laughs> interview. That would be amazing. I'd love to do that. Oh, there's one other thing that I found is yeah. really helpful. Um, I'm a professional clown on the side. That's why I did the 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 uh, lady lady liberty kind of thing at our Bank mm -hmm. of America stuff. But I carry a clown kit with me, an instant mm. clown kit with a red nose and some lipstick and some things. Um, because I found that clown energy, like old people energy, can diffuse a situation. The humor energy that, the, yeah. The humor energy, yeah. and you know, it, it diffuses it. It doesn't, it doesn't get rid of it, but it diffuses it. And yeah. so sometimes I find it necessary to use that as opposed to my granny stuff. Sure. And um, it's an interesting, interesting kind of perspective on things. It just, you know, I had never thought doing the clowning <laughs> stuff would have any impact on that, but, but it does. Yeah. So, so I carry, I literally carry my instant clown set with me all of the time yeah. and, and um, use that. So there are various ways of approaching issues and confrontations and like when they tend to get to the violent stage, that's where a clown can step in yeah. and defuse it, yeah. um, even more so than a granny, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And these are actually all topics that would be great for future episodes. Mm -hmm. There's the power of humor. In, yeah. in power dynamics. There's also music and yes. dance, you know, the power those have. They can mm -hmm. be incredible tools in, a, in actual protest and activism, and, right. but also in just any moment of conflict. Yes. You know, these tools could be used. The power so. of the arts is phenomenal, yeah. and it has been all through history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Well, great talking to you. Great talking to you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Um, thank you, those that dropped in. Hey, Stevie, and uh, Drew dropped in for a little bit. Let's just see what Drew said. He said, okay. did you guys already talk about the Bernie thing? Or am I way off topic here? Feel free to move along. <laughs> I really thought there was a lot of grassroots action for Oh, yeah. All right, so that's the whole Bernie Sanders grassroots. Yes, that, yes. Donald Trump, too, is actually an example of grassroots power. He is, it's, yes. It's uh, on the left and the right wing. Yep. So, Stevie, uh, you need to be a guest someday. Um, I think he's uh, he's off to is he off in college yet? Yeah, 
He should be. He's off in college. Started now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, that's it for this episode of the Mindful Activist. Thank you, Barbara, for joining. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see past episodes on the Global Consensus Project org or on the Mindful Activist uh, Facebook page. Um, we're going to be doing more uh, episodes and. There's going to be lots of opportunities for people to join in and be part of the discussion um, as we work out the kinks in making that happen. So thank Power you. Power to the people. <laughs> <All right. laughs> thank you, everyone that dropped in or who watched this on reruns. Thank you. So we're going to stop this. Okay.